Thank you, Martin, Lisa, and Debbie. This morning, as you can see, we are having communion service today. And uh, as we begin, I want to just ask you to kneel with me for a word of prayer. Our loving Father in heaven, again, we humbly kneel before you this morning. And Lord, we just ask that as we take these few minutes today to remember all that heaven has done in our behalf, that our hearts would be truly opened by your Holy Spirit, that we would realize the great depths that you are willing to reach so that we might have the opportunity for eternal life. And Lord, sometimes we're a little hard-headed, we're a little slow, we're a, a little resistant to your love. And we pray that this morning that all those barriers would be fallen down and that our hearts would be open and receptive to the moving of your Holy Spirit upon us. I pray that as I speak this morning that you would empower me with the coals from the fire from on high, that you would anoint my lips with the words that only you would want us to hear today. And I pray that you would bless our time together. I pray that our hearts will be drawn to you because of the time we spend together today. For we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. On February 16, 1989, the lives of George and Vera Bajenski of Ontario, Canada were changed forever. Now, it was a normal Thursday morning in their life, but at about 9.15, the phone rang, and the voice on the other end of the phone said, there's been an accident, and your son was involved. The accident took place right in front of the high school down the street, and that's all the information they got. So with anxious hearts, they jumped in their car, and they drove down to the scene of this accident that took place at an intersection right near the high school. They could see the flashing lights and the police cars and, and all of the excitement as they pulled up. But as they got out of the car, Vera noticed a photographer and she began to follow where the lens was directed. And as she followed that line of sight, she came upon the largest pool of blood she had ever seen. All she could say at that moment to her husband was it appeared that their son had probably not made it. Her first reaction was to jump out of the car and somehow collect all of that blood and put it back into her son. That blood, she said, for me at that moment, because the most precious thing in the world, because it was life. It was life-giving blood and it belonged in my son, my only son, the one I loved so much. The road was dirty and the blood just didn't belong there. George noticed that the cars were beginning to drive through the intersection again, right through the blood. His heart was smitten. He wanted to cover the blood with his coat and cry out, You will not drive over the blood of my son. It was then that Vera understood for the first time in her life one of God's greatest and most beautiful truths. Why blood? Because it was the strongest language God could have used. It was the most precious thing he could have given, the highest price he could have paid. Through God's amazing love, we were redeemed with the precious blood of Christ. Amen. This morning, our topic is why blood? And I invite you, if you have a Bible with you, to turn with me again to our scripture for today found in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 and 19. I hope that as we spend this time together that we will begin to have a much greater value for the sacrifice that Jesus has made for us. That when we come to communion, it won't be just that usual once a quarter thing that we do, but it will have such great meaning to us that we wouldn't miss it for the world. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18 Peter says to us, For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by traditions from your fathers, 
but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. In a book called Amazing Grace, page 172, Ellen White says, Ye know, says Peter, that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold. She says, Oh, had these been sufficient to purchase the salvation of man, how easily it might have been accomplished by him who says, The silver is mine and the gold is mine. But the transgressor of God's holy law could be redeemed only by the precious blood of the Son of God. You know, the word blood is mentioned in the Bible in 375 verses. It's spoken of over 400 times. And Peter tells us in that verse this morning that we are redeemed by the precious blood of Christ. This morning, let us consider just why that blood is so precious to us. Now we all know in the very beginning of time that God told man that there is life in the blood in Genesis 9 and verse 4. We know that without blood there can be no physical life. But Jesus tells us that unless we drink of his blood, there can be no spiritual life and there can be no eternal life. If you would turn with me in your Bibles to John chapter 6 as we move forward. John chapter 6 verses 53 through 58. We see Jesus' own words of how important it is that we accept the blood of Jesus Christ in our behalf. John chapter 6 beginning in verse 53. John chapter 6, verse 53, Jesus said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except ye eat of the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. As the living Father hath sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. This is that bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever." Jesus wants us to know this morning that it is only through his precious blood that we will obtain the salvation that hopefully we so dearly desire today. In Desire of Ages, page 389, it says, To eat the flesh and drink the blood of Christ is to receive him as a personal Savior, believing that he forgives our sins and that we are complete in him. It is by beholding his love, by dwelling upon it, by drinking it in, that we are to become partakers of his nature. What food is to the body, Christ must be to the soul. Food cannot benefit us unless we eat it, unless it becomes a part of our being. So Christ is of no value to us if we do not know him as a personal savior. So we look at number one, the Bible tells us there is life in the blood. We also realize that as we read in our verse that we are redeemed by this blood. Our verse today told us that we were redeemed by the precious blood. In Colossians chapter 1 and verse, 10, verse 14, Paul also says that we have redemption through the blood. And then I thought of the verse that we sang or we are going to sing at the end of our service today, redeemed how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed through His infinite mercy, His child and forever I am. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, how I love to proclaim it, His child and forever I am. You know, when you, th when you sing the songs of redemption, do you really think about the words that you sing? Do you think about what it really means to us as a Christian, as a follower of Christ? Or have you been coming to church so long and singing this song so long, you've got them down in your head, but it's really just rattling off something that's from memory? Hopefully every time we sing the words of these kind of songs, they remind us 
of a God that loves us. As Barry told us in our Sabbath school lesson this morning, a God with infinite love that loved us so much that he was willing to pour out all of heaven in our behalf. My concern this morning is that we think of that once in a while, but it doesn't permeate our very being. It doesn't register as we go out into life and as we look at our fellow man, it doesn't register how much God loves me, therefore he calls me to love my fellow man in the same way. I thought about it the other day as I was driving by one of those people standing on the corner with their sign. I had just bought a few groceries and, and it was sitting in a bag by my, by my chair and, and I was getting that torn feeling. Should I, should I re roll down my window and, and hand them something and, and grab a book from the back? What do I do? And then all of a sudden the light changed and the opportunity was gone. But are we thinking about the salvation of others? Are we thinking about the fact that that precious blood of redemption isn't just for us, it's for the entire world? Does the thought ever run through your mind that Jesus shed that blood even for those who would never accept the gift? And we're not the ones that decide. Our job, if Jesus has touched our lives, is to continue reaching out until the very last opportunity is gone. Redeemed by the blood. We also know that because of the blood there is remission for sins. Go with me to Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26 and verse 28. This, this is one that really should touch your hearts. And, and I hope that after we just go through this one verse and look at a couple of items from that verse, that we will have a whole new perspective on the blood of Christ. Matthew chapter 26 and verse 28. It's a verse that we've read many times and often it's referenced during the communion service. In fact, we know that Paul has repeated these words in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. But notice what Jesus says. For this is whose blood? This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Now, you know, I was very interested when I thought about that word remission. Because in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 14, Paul, along with telling us that there is redemption through the blood, said that there is even the forgiveness of sins. But when you go and you look, and I'm not one of those people that likes to always tell you to go look at the Greek, but I thought it was interesting because when you look at the definition of remission in the dictionary, it's near, nowhere near as comprehensive as the Greek word gives us. The Greek word is ephesus, a simple little word, but remission in that Greek language means five things, and I thought it was pretty incredible. It means freedom, it means pardon, it means deliverance, it means forgiveness, and it means liberty. You see, Jesus didn't just die to forgive your sins. Jesus died to deliver you from sin. Jesus died to set you at liberty from sin. To deliver you from the bondage and the chains of sin and to empower you to live a life away from sin. I hope that today as you go home that you might consider and study a few of these points out in your own time. Our third thing is the pure blood of Christ is cleansing. Now, we're all familiar with the grape juice that we use. You know, a lot of churches use grape juice. There are some that use wine. We choose to use grape juice because when that wine is made, it goes through a fermentation process. And when fermentation is going on, it's actually a rotting that's taking place. Now, can you imagine rotten fermented juice representing the pure sinless life and blood of Jesus? That's why we choose to use the pure, pure unfermented grape juice to represent that pure sinless blood. In John 1, 1 John 1 and verse 9, say it with me. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If you were to go back just a couple of verses in 1 John 1 and verse 7, 
That tells us that if we walk in the light as He is in the light, then we have fellowship one with another and what? The blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. You see, the blood of Jesus is not just redemptive, but it also is for remission of sins. It also is to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And does that bring to your mind anything? If I sing to you the words of a song, let me see if you can sing back to me the refrain. What can wash away my sin? What can make me whole within? Sing it with me. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. You see, as we sing these songs, we can look back in time and remember how important these truths were to those who have gone before us. Those who recognized what that blood really means in their lives. And in our song service this morning, Linda had us sing a song that you all probably remember too. The cleansing stream I see, I see. I plunge and oh, it cleanses me. Oh, praise the Lord, it cleanses me. It cleanses me. Yes, cleanses me. The precious pure blood of Christ cleanses us from all sin. The one that really is encouraging to me, though, there is power in the blood. Go with me to Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 11. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 11 helps us to see there is power in the blood of Jesus. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 11. It's a verse that you all know, and again, it's a verse that is read often in our denomination. Beginning, it says, and they overcame him by what? They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, and they loved not their and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto death. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. There is power in the blood of Jesus, the power in the blood of Jesus to give us victory over sin in our lives today. Again, Jesus didn't come and die just to redeem sinful man from sin. He came to give sinful man victory over sin. You see, Jesus didn't say, you know what, I came and I died for your sins, and now one day you're going to be able to step away from it because I'm going to take you to the kingdom. No, Jesus came and lived a life as an example so that we could see that by God's grace through His power, we could overcome sin. Now the good news is that the sin that we can overcome is anger, bitterness, envy, Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, the pride of life. We can overcome even those sins through the power of the blood of Jesus. Would you be free from your burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you or evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. How many of you believe that this morning? Amen. Amen. Well, I was kind of concerned because it took you a few minutes to get rolling on that last song. <laughs> and I know you like to sing, and so I, I knew that as we got going that, that we would pick it up a little bit. But there is power in the blood of Jesus. And in Heavenly Places, page 278, we are told, the Savior watches with a deep interest over the human family. When He ascended to the Father, He did not leave His followers without help. In his earthly life, he overcame in their behalf, and they are to overcome in his strength. All have trials to meet. There are the old natural temperaments to contend with. 
But these temperaments are, not, are, are to be brought into subjection to Jesus Christ, that we may stand on vantage ground with God. The crown of glory will be placed on the brow of all who have overcome temptation by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. Aren't you encouraged this morning to know that there's so much involved in the blood of Jesus Christ? The blood of Jesus Christ is redemptive. The blood of Jesus Christ brings remission for sins. It sets us at liberty. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. The blood of Jesus Christ empowers us to live and to walk as he walked. Would you be free from the burden of sin? There's power in the blood. You know, one of the things that really struck me as I was going through this study is that there is protection in the blood of Christ. Go with me to Exodus chapter 12 and verse 13. Exodus chapter 12 and verse 13. A beautiful thought that through the blood of Christ there is protection for his children. Exodus chapter 12 and verse 13. Let's go ahead and begin in verse 12 of Exodus 12. The Bible says, For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. Aren't you thankful for the protection of the blood of Christ? And you see that protection, if we are in Christ, if we are daily drinking of His blood, as Jesus said in John chapter 6, if we are doing that, then the protection of Jesus is with us. And I'm not saying that means that there may not be an accident or something happen in your life. I'm saying that that protection will be to keep you from falling. That protection will be to keep you from being drawn away. Rosa mentioned in our Sabbath school class that Jesus made the statement that no man can pluck us out of his hand. You see, if we have received Christ into our hearts, he's made the promise, no matter what happens in life, no matter what goes on, no man can pluck us out of his hand. There is safety in the blood of Jesus Christ. In Selected Messages, book 3, page 172, it says, The only safety for the Israelites was blood upon the doorpost. God said, When I see the blood, I will pass over you. All other devices for safety would be without avail. Nothing but the blood on the doorpost would bar the way that the angel of death should not enter. There is salvation for the sinner in the blood of Jesus Christ alone, which cleanseth us from all sin. Christ was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Saved by the blood of Jesus Christ will be our only hope for time and our song throughout eternity. Which takes me to the next thought, that through the blood of Jesus there is eternal life. In his own words, in what we read in John chapter 6 and verse 54, Jesus said, Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life. Are you understanding this morning the precious gift of the blood of the Lamb? Are you accepting and receiving the forgiveness the cleansing, the power, the protection, the life and redemption that is only through the blood of Christ. As you think of the story of redemption, realize that the story of redemption is painted with the blood of the Savior. Through the blood of Christ, we see all of heaven was poured out for us. But the interesting thing is we think about the blood of Jesus is he did not just give his blood he gave up a part of his divinity forever. Before Jesus came and became a man, became one with us, he was omnipresent. He could be everywhere at once. But now Jesus has given up that part of his divinity for you and for me. And I don't think we think about that. 
Oh, we think about, oh, well, you know, Jesus, when he returned to heaven, he promised the Holy Spirit, and we knew that the Holy Spirit could be with us everywhere, but did we remember that Jesus gave up that aspect of divinity, and he no longer has the ability to be everywhere at once? He did that for you and for me. It was symbolized through the giving and the sacrifice of his very own blood, showing us that he was willing to do everything possible that we might be redeemed. Why blood? Because it was the strongest language God could have used. It was the most precious thing he could give. It was the highest price that he could pay. And through God's amazing love, we are redeemed through the precious blood of Christ. May this theme touch our hearts this morning as we go through our service for today. And right now I'm going to invite you to join together as we go down to our fellowship hall. We're going to go down for the ordinance of humility. There are three sections there. There's a section for the ladies who would like to partake together. There is a section for couples, and there is a section for the men. And I would like to ask you all to feel free to go down and partake, and then we will return here for the communion service itself. But let's just bow our heads for a word of prayer as we go. Our loving Father in heaven, as we contemplate the infinite gift of love that you have given us and the power and the efficacy of the blood that was shed in our behalf, we pray, Lord, that this will be something that will be in our minds constantly as we go through life, that we will always remember the many different aspects that the blood represents to us in our salvation. So be with us now as we go and partake of the ordinance of humility, and then when we come back and enjoy the service of communion together, may our hearts be stirred to the very depths of our soul, and may we be encouraged today as we go forth from this place. So bless us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed.